Welcome to the Practical Horseman podcast, featuring conversations with respected riders, industry leaders, and horse care experts. The show is co-hosted by Practical Horseman editors, and our goal is to inform, educate, and inspire. I'm Sandra Olenek, and this week's episode is with two-time Olympic show jumping medalist, Leslie Burr Howard. Leslie was rising to fame just as I started competing. She's always been one of my favorite Grand Prix show jumpers, and I was really excited to speak with her. We chatted in early April by telephone after the final week of the Winter Equestrian Festival. Now 65 years old, Leslie was a star from early on. She won the 1972 ASPCA McClay National Championship and rose through the Grand Prix ranks to win a team gold medal at the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics riding Albany. That year, she won the American Grand Prix Rider of the Year title, and a year earlier, Albany won the AGA Horse of the Year award. In 1986, Leslie won the FEI World Cup Finals riding McLean and was named the American Horse Show's Equestrian of the Year. In 1992, she was paired with the legendary Jem Twist for injured rider Greg Best. That year, Jem was named the AGA Horse of the Year. Leslie also competed in the 1994 World Equestrian Games, and in 1996, she helped the U.S. show jumping team win a silver medal at the Atlanta Olympics Riding Extreme. A year later, she won the world's richest Grand Prix at the time, the DeMarie at Spruce Meadows in Calgary, riding Spleft. During the interview, she explains why he's a favorite horse of hers. After that, Leslie continued winning major Grand Prix, and in 2020, after capturing the blue in some Grand Prix in Tryon, North Carolina, she celebrated 40 years of victories since her first, the President's Cup at the Washington International Horse Show in 1979. During our conversation, Leslie shares how she started riding, winning the McClay on a short-strided pinto, special horses and wins in her career, what she thinks makes a good horseman, and what she's doing now. About halfway through the interview, there's a part that I found especially interesting. Leslie is known for having very steady competition nerves, and I asked her about that. Some of it is how she's wired, but I also took to heart what she says about keeping riding and competing in perspective, which centers on having fun, doing your best, and not getting caught up in emotional turmoil. I also like her answer to a question about her training philosophy, which not surprisingly focuses on keeping a horse happy so he'll want to do his job. Before we get into the conversation, I'd like to share a word from this episode's sponsor, Bimeda. Bimeda might just be the largest animal health company you've never heard of. Till now. Bimeda Animal Health equine products have been trusted by veterinarians and horse owners since the 1960s, where our Irish roots began. Bimeda is one of the largest producers of dewormers for horses, like Equimax, Bimectin, Duramectin, and Exodus. World-renowned equine athletes rely on polyglycan, a patented formula designed to replace lost or damaged synovial fluid, and Confidence EQ. 1% pheromone gel that reduces and prevents equine stress. These are to name just a few of our branded products. We encourage you to consult with your equine veterinarian before using any equine products for your horse. Also, please visit bimedaus.com to learn more about our full product offerings and where you can buy them. During today's interview, we had a few technical glitches and there are a few scratchy moments. I apologize about that, but you'll still be able to hear. And now let's jump right into the conversation where Leslie starts by talking about how she became interested in horses. Oh, oh, you know, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I was four years old. And I had to have a pony. Um, my parents were both in the New York theater, knew nothing about horses. And I just decided when I was four years old that there was that I had to have a pony. So we went down to the local pony farm, uh, Shetland Pony Farm, and I picked one out and I named him Topper. And I put a big Western saddle on him and I galloped around the field all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So you, so there is nothing that like, other than you just knew you always wanted a pony. 
yeah, I just had to have a pony. And then, you know, as time went on, then I, you know, I, I was fortunate enough because Sharon Hardy called Tom Hardy. Uh, Tom actually rode for the team and uh, Sharon um, was my trainer for years and years until I went with George. Uh, they had a, a pony farm, uh, not the Shepherd pony farm. Uh, the, uh, the Highfields ponies were one of the top, it was the top breeding uh, farm of ponies, uh, hunter ponies in those days. And they just lived a mile from my house. So I would go up there and, and, uh, ride every day and, um, fall off every day and <laughs> get back on and fall off. And that was, that was my life for about the next five years. Oh gosh. <laughs> Is that where you develop your toughness? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But we couldn't afford a pony. Uh, so the only way I would get rides is if I, uh, literally I broke, I broke the, the two year old thoroughbred Welsh pony crosses that they had. Um, when I was about, oh God, I was doing that when I was about probably nine years old, <laughs> 10 years old. And, uh, yeah. So I just, you know, learned to stay on and, and, uh, it, it just didn't ever discourage me falling off. Why do you think that is? Cause it seems like falling off is a lot of people really don't like to do that. Yeah, no, I know. I don't particularly like to do it anymore, <laughs> but, um, I think it just didn't, for some reason it didn't scare me. Uh, and I knew that if I wanted to ride, that was the reality, you know, my parents were going to buy me a pony. So I had to, I had to, you know, I had to tough it out and ride the ones that were giving me. And, and, and let me also say, they gave me a lot of lovely ponies to ride too. It wasn't all bad. Uh, it was, it was more good than bad. Uh, I, I got a lot of top ponies to show, uh, starting when I was like eight years old. And, um, and, but you know, part of the deal is I had to also ride the naughty ponies and break the young ponies. So it was a, it was a great opportunity to have while you're that young. And, you know, when you're young, you bounce and I don't think you, you take, you know, take the bad side so seriously. Right. Right. Um, moving forward a little bit, you won the ASPCA McClay finals in 1972 at age 15. Right. Um, right. Can you just talk about what that experience was like? Well, <laughs> so I went to ride, I was with Sharon up until I was about 13. And then she said, you know, you really need to go to George Morrison and, um, and get more instructions. Um, so I went went with George, uh, but I came with Sharon, the horse, the horse I won the finals on. But she was a very small pinto horse with not a lot of stride. And uh, so when I came to George, George said, "Well, you know, you know, I'll take you on for sure, but you know, you have to get a better horse than this pinto horse." <laughs> uh -huh. So my mother says, "Well, that's all we have is this pinto horse." So. So you, you just got to make do. So uh, George, uh, of, course, of course, you know, George was begrudgingly, okay, well, we'll, we'll keep the Pinto. Well, of course, I ended up winning the clay finals on the Pinto. And uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, it's sort of a fairy tale story, I know, but, but uh, it, it, all, it all worked out. So you've been on a, a lot of U.S. teams with a lot of famous riders, you know, Joe Farges, Conrad Holmfeld, Melanie Smith-Taylor. I guess, do you have any any favorite memories of times with them or, or other riders? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, um, it's always great to ride on a team. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's fun. It's uh, it's. A different obviously experience from riding as an individual um you know obviously going to the olympics and and, and both in la and then in 84 and you know getting gold and silver medals for put the icing on the cake cake but i think um i think the i i, I think the the biggest memory of teams is it's such a great feeling to ride for your country and uh you know, um, and it's a, a really good feeling to beat the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Wants to be, you know, and, um, uh, in those days. I mean, they still are, obviously. But um, actually, there's so many good teams now. But I think in those days, you know, it was always Germany versus U.S. In my mind, that's the way I always saw it. Uh, 
and uh, it's just always it's such a great feeling, especially you know I was fortunate enough both games to to um, uh, be riding for our country at home in LA and Atlanta, and uh, so that 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 make you know, that makes it extra special for sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and then talking about the horses, you know, you've certainly had a lot of special horses. Is there, you know, one or a few who stand out? Um, for sure. Uh, you know, I think everybody would think that, that my immediate answer would be Jim Twist because he was such a famous horse. And, and I was so lucky to have that opportunity to ride him. Um, and, um, but I think my favorite horse of all times uh, was just one that uh, the horse had believed to won the um, big Masters Grand Prix at Spruce Meadows on. Uh, and, and he was my favorite because when I got Jim, he was already a famous horse and, you know, Greg had made him famous and he'd done such wonderful things already. So, you know, there was nothing really I could do to, to you know, make things <laughs> <laughs> more memorable. I mean, for sure, after winning the silver medal and sold it, you know, anything I did was just step down. <laughs> um, but again, an, an honor to ride him. But uh, with some leaf, he's a horse we bought as a six year old, and he had a great personality. And uh, so I brought him up from his you know, very first horse show, basically, mm-hmm. right through to, to competing on Nations Cups and then winning the Masters Grand Prix at Spruce Meadows. So that, he was actually my favorite horse of all time. Great. We've talked a little bit about the Olympics. I mean, is, is there a particular competition that stands out as like the best in your career? Oh, I would say the yeah, I would say the De Maurier, the okay, it's called the CN now or CP now, I guess it's Bruce Meadows. Uh, those days, um, the, the 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 main sponsor for the um, Masters Grand Prix at Bruce Meadows was um, De Maurier. It was a cigarette company, and uh, again, again at that time, it was it was the biggest Grand Prix in the world. Uh, I think it was uh, 750,000 then. Now, of course, I think it's two or three million. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was by far the biggest money class uh, in in the world at that time. And uh, and, uh, so I think that was, that stands out. Well, that that and winning the World Cup finals um, Mm -hmm. also stands out as, as, probably my two fondest memories obviously the 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 team gold and the team silver um are memories but in different ways because that was a team situation and um these were individual um Mm -hmm. awards so yeah both important for different reasons yeah you know obviously as you said they're the two individual competitions are important. Why Why are they so special to you? Well, I mean, to win either the World Cup, you know, it's not easy to win the World Cup. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not easy to win the, win the, the biggest Grand Prix in, in the world, I guess. Uh, you know, if I had to say, was there anything else, you know, individually, obviously the Aachen Grand Prix, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, I never accomplished that. Uh, those would have been some goals if if, uh, if you were to ask me. But, um, yeah, they're just extremely prestigious events. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's what we do. I mean, that's what you, that's what you, um, your goals are. That's what you, you know, do this every day is, is to ride the best you can at the, at the top events in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, at the the 1984 Olympics, uh, which you rode on Albany, what what was that experience like? Yeah, it was it was actually, it, um, you know, I think you always imagine that uh, the Olympics, Olympics as being you know, nerve wracking, and, and I was found actually the most nerve wracking part of. Uh, a, a world championship or an Olympic Games was was getting there. Um, you know, qualifying and the especially um, well, no, it's still it's still true today. You know, qualifying is, is hard. You know, because you're you're going against you know ten, twelve other people that also want to spot on that team, and that that's to me the hard part. The hard part is qualifying and maintaining that high level for the for the months before the competition you know, to prove that you're worthy to to go. Um, once you're there, it's actually I, I found a. a not at all stressful just you know go in do your best and have fun really and you know hopefully come out there with a clear round and 
win a medal for your country. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I remember talking to Ann Krasinski, um, who was your teammate in the 96 games, and she was talking about how you're very uh, different competitors that she's sort of had to work on the mental skills aspects of riding. And I can't remember exactly how she phrased it, but she said you were much more relaxed about it and, and a, a fun teammate to have and, and kind of gave her a different perspective. Uh, is that just something that you've always had? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, worrying and being nervous, it really doesn't do you a whole lot of good. So why do you do it? Um, why would you do it? Um, <laughs> And I, I do think I've always had that mental ability to just tone things down and, and just look at them in perspective. And, you know, it is at the end of the day, yeah, we all want to do well, but at the end of the day, it is just another day in your life and it is just another 12 set of jumps. And so, you you know, you do the best you can, you prepare the best, but to, to weigh yourself down with all the emotional, you know, uh, crap, <laughs> for lack of a better word, you know, it just doesn't seem you know why so don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah is that is that something you can convey to your students who yeah i mean and everybody everybody manifests manifests things differently though you know i think you know Anne by nature is a you know she's she's very focused and and you know we we everybody's different so everybody has to has to get to that moment in the best way they can and you know hopefully you you know yourself enough that that you know that you you can do that some people you know like to listen to music go off by themselves some people like to just you know sit down and joke around it's just it's whatever whatever puts you in the best state or frame of mind so do you have any kind of routine before a competition or absolutely not no okay <laughs> no no i get up every morning i brush my teeth i wash my face um and i go down i have a cup of coffee and i go to the bar and you know go to the bar go to the show you know do my flat work, prepare for my class and go. No, there's no, there's no magic to it. There's no special <laughs> there's no, no routine or anything. I just, you know, you flat your horse, you get your horse in the best possible mental and physical state you can. And then you do your regular school. Don't make it any different or harder that day. Just do your normal school that got you to where you are and do your best in the ring. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so now you've certainly won a lot, but um, also, you know, not winning is, is part of competing. So how do you handle like, you know, when things don't go your way or, or you lose, you know, especially a class you really wanted to win? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you just have to take it day by day, really, is all I can say. You know, you do. I think what you have to realize in this sport is you're going to uh, jump more for fault, eight fault rounds than you are clear rounds. Um, Joe Farges actually, in that respect, always had a great, a great phrase. And he never said, he always said, never to be too mad, sad or glad, uh, which is a wonderful phrase because, you know, when you win, don't be, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's nice, but don't be too excited because you're going to lose the next day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, and if you know Joe, you know he's very level. He's probably he's he's more level than I am in that respect. I mean, it, he's so non faced at least outwardly by by everything, everything. You know, you just it's another day, and he in that way he's a fun teammate to have because he's he has a very calming. Uh, uh, very calming, um, you know, uh, for, he's a very calming force on everybody around him. Hmm. That's fascinating. So, um, talking a little bit about training horses, could you, uh, describe your overall training philosophy? I think that probably my biggest philosophy is the horse, the horse has to be happy. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of people in my mind over training and, you know, over disciplining and, you know, the horse has to want to do his job. Obviously, they, you have to do the flat work. Obviously, they have to they have to listen. They have to do what you want. But at, at the same time, they have to go out there with a, a feeling of they're having fun and they're, they're enjoying their work. You know, I, I, it's always upsetting to me when I see people getting on horses and they're yanking them up and spurring them and, you know, legging them this way and legging them the other way. And the poor horses, they're, you know, they're just miserable. Well, you know, why would you want to put out for that person? What joy could you possibly have in jumping a jump when you've just been tortured to 
for the last mm-hmm. 20 minutes. Um, so, yes, I do think that, um, yes, obviously I flat my horses. I think I flat them very well, but, but you never, I really try very hard never to get ang- uh, angry. I don't think I, actually, I don't think I ever get angry. You know, you have to ask yourself, why is this horse not doing what I'm asking? Rather than just getting irritated, you know, uh, figure out what, you know, what it is that's bothering him that he can't perform the task that you're asking him to do. And when you start to you know, ask yourself, what, you know, why is he reacting the way he is, then there's no need for anger and there's no need for, uh, you know, abuse, period, mm-hmm. the end. Right. Um, and sort of in a similar light, what, what do you think makes a good horseman? Somebody who somebody who likes their horses. Um, obviously, the attention. Okay, okay, that that's a long list. Obviously, the attention to detail. You know, right from you know looking at the horse in the stall. Um, you know, knowing. No, you know, the, the, I don't muck a lot of stalls these days. Days actually, I don't do any. But but I know how to muck a stall, and I know that that you know if the horse is if if the horse is is behaving differently in this stall, there's something maybe not quite right or if his you know if his manure is different or if he's if he's you know depressed in the corner or if he's resting one leg more than he usually does or resting any leg for that matter or you know look at his eyes see if he's looking nervous see if he's looking happy see if he's looking relaxed see if he's looking scared i mean you know that's all part of being a horseman it's just it's just looking at your horse knowing your horse noticing the little obviously you have to check their legs duh um but beyond that noticing the little the little changes in personality or or the you know the the changes in in the way they position themselves when they're standing you know all these things come into you know horsemanship period know know your horse know what's normal for your horse not what's not for your horse analyze your horse's moods why he's having these moods um you know why he or why he's you know nervous one day why he's relaxed the next day it all you know that it all that you know he's just they're just reacting to how they feel and a good horseman notices that and then reacts accordingly in a positive way hmm. right and do you have a, like a favorite training exercise or type of work that you do with a lot of your horses? Um, not really a favorite, I would say. Um, you know, every horse has a little, you know, we, a little gymnastic over little cavaletti rails that you know you'll you'll pick different little exercises for each horse. If one horse is a little slow, you might do a little bounce. If one horse is crooked, you might have you know landing rails on the landing. You know, if they're a little crooked in front, you have takeoff rails. And just you, you just have little. You know, you have to just analyze what are what are the horse's weaknesses, and how could little uh, little easy gymnastics help that horse? I don't do big gymnastics um, as a rule. Uh, I don't do gymnastics that are going to try to trap the horse. Uh, because I found that, you know, gymnastics that are too difficult tend to make them a little bit nervous. And uh, again, not not really, you know, you don't want a horse coming on course down to the triple combination thinking, oh my God, there must be a trap here. Mm. <laughs> you, you want them coming down to the triple combination thinking, you know, looking at it, understanding it, and in and, and his mind knowing he can do it. Um, so, yes, little gymnastics. I do a lot of big gymnastics, not really. We have a beautiful field here at our farm. Uh, we, I like to take them out and do nice, nice flowing courses on the Grand Prix field. I think that's good for them, um, you know, good for their minds. Um, also, jumping on turf is better than jumping on sand, in my opinion. So we do a lot of that. And... Uh, yeah, no, I think you just have to take in each horse individually and, you know, build a program for that horse that's going to make him be the best he can. Great. You seem to have a lot of students. I mean, I saw you over the weekend. How is that going? Yeah, I don't think, you know, in, in the old days, <laughs> I was going back when my, when, uh, well, well um, you know, about 30 years ago when we had all the equitation, all the hunters. Yeah, you know, we used to have 60 horses on the work list um, back in the days when I was doing with Bruce and Bruce Burr and Molly Ash Collie. Um, no, we'd have, you know, six, 65, 70 on the work list. Um, I don't do that anymore. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I have no desire to do it anymore. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, I have I have a nice group of students, probably I don't know, four or five. I want to say mm -hmm. a nice group of courses, probably the numbers around 25. And um, I, I enjoy teaching. Uh, I enjoy, I have more young horses now than I ever have had before, which I thoroughly enjoy. I have a wonderful rider who's doing a lot of the riding for me, Jad Dana, who is a super talent and just, you know, he's been making a name for himself in this sport in the Grand Prix. So it's, it's fun. It's fun. I still enjoy riding myself, but for sure I don't compete nearly as at the level I used to. Although I have to admit, if I had a superstar horse, you could probably talk me into it. <laughs> but right now I'm, I'm enjoying riding the young horses. I'm enjoying bringing Jad's career to, um, you know, as high a level as as we possibly can get to. And I think that's going to be pretty darn high. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, you know, I enjoy teaching, teaching the young kids, you know, who aspire to be Grand Prix. How, how did you make that, you know, was it the change kind of gradual from when you were competing a lot or, you know, and kind of those, like you said? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, gradual, for sure. Uh, and I, to be honest, I'm sure I still, uh, my, my, my Grand Prix horse I had last year, uh, Special, got hurt this year. And I'm sure if she hadn't gotten hurt, I'd still be showing in the Grand Prix. I'm sure if I have another horse down the road that, that I really like and enjoy, I'm sure I'll be doing it again. Uh, mm -hmm. But in terms of, you know, me being focused on, you know, Olympic Games and, and championships and blah, blah, blah. You know, let's face it, I'm 65. Um, you know, if the right horse comes along, I'd love to show in the top classes, but it's not that, that's not, that's not the, my number one goal right now in life. Mm -hmm. And it, it happened gradually. I mean, basically it happened because um, my last, I, I, I brought, I've had a lot of joint replacements. I've had one knee and two hips, uh, mm -hmm. all of which have gone fabulously. Um, but the last one, I, you know, I couldn't ride for two months. So Chad got to take over the rides and he was doing such a super job. I was like, wow, this guy can really ride. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we need to give him a shot. So, you know, and that's, that's pretty much how it has evolved. Great. How would you say, you know, I guess, this, uh, how would you say you, you've sort of balanced family life with such a, a busy schedule? Well, I mean, my family is my life. I mean, you know, Peter, my husband, uh, he's, you know, he himself uh, competed internationally um, for Canada in three-day eventing. He adores the sport. He adores the horses. He adores all animals, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, he... he that's, that has that has never been his profession, and by profession he's a lawyer. Hmm. Uh, but you know his his passion his passion um, has always been the horses. Uh, you know his business is the law, but his passion is the horses. So that that's always made it um, you know so you know so easy because he he takes as much of an interest in all the horses as I do, and we now have this beautiful farm in in Wellington that that we've had for four years. And uh, yeah, he he's he's thoroughly enjoying uh, farm life. So it it uh, you know he mows he sets the courses he mows the Grand Prix field. He <laughs> he's uh, you know he's as he's still practicing law. He's also Farmer Joe half the time. So <laughs> you know that it's not a balance really. It's not one you know how do you balance it? It's, we we just both work together for the same goals. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's never a, you know, oh, I have to give up this because Peter wants that. No, we both want the same thing. So that, that's not really a, even an issue in our, in our family, in our marriage. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, so um, what are, do you have other interests besides horses and riding? No, I actually don't. Isn't that sad? Um, <laughs> I'm a dreadful golfer. I'm not much better at tennis. Um, and uh, not a dreadful tennis player, too, I'll be honest. Um, I ride very well. I you know, love to teach, love to ride. And there's nothing, uh, 
Peter always said, we, Peter and I went on one vacation before we were married, so that would have been 26 years ago. And he, he said that it was like being, being, being with a caged animal. <laughs> 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 that I was so tense not being not being able to go and ride and be with my horses. <laughs> he said he says it was it was it was a it was a very tedious week long vacation because all I was doing was, you know, pacing <laughs> trying to get out there to get back home. Um so uh yeah. No, I don't really. Uh, my parents were, as I mentioned earlier, my parents were in the theater. I do love music. I do love uh, the, the theater. Um, but outside of that, really, um, I'm very content in my everyday life. Great. And, you know, is there any advice that you'd give your younger self? Uh, um, in other words, the things that maybe I should have done differently. Um, no, really, I um, no. I think I think I I always you know I always um, did what I thought was the best way to approach things in terms of what's best best for the horse. Um, probably there are times in my life when I should have been a better business person. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, the, the, you know, m- money has never really been that important to me. You know, I, I've been fortunate enough to have a great career and fortunate enough to have great clients. Probably I um, should have looked after the business if I wanted to have more money today. But that's not, that isn't really important to me. Um I have a, you know, I have a great life and, and the most important thing is, you know, to just see these horses looking happy and healthy and enjoying watching them progress. That, that, that's what, that's, what's important to me. Hmm. Great. And I guess just to wrap up, um, can you, do you have any, I guess, can you explain why, why you think you've been so successful over, over such a long career? Um, yeah, so many different reasons. Uh, first of all, um, as I said, I, I, as a competitor, I think I'm not a nervous competitor, and I've always been probably pretty brave uh, and competitive. You know, it's never, you know, uh, uh, you know, working with students who, you know, are a little afraid to go fast or afraid to lose or afraid, you know, they they're too involved in all the things that can go wrong instead of just going out there and just you know having fun doing your best and being competitive trying to win um i think i had a pretty good or i have a pretty good competitive nature um obviously luck has a lot to do with it i had i was very fortunate to get to have great owners um in my career um a lot of great owners who 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 back to me with top top horses so that was you know that was another reason for success, you know, and then along with having great owners, fortunately to have, a, um, to have had great courses, um, you know, what, and that, that, you know, that ability to pick a horse that suits your style, that suits the way you ride. And I seem to have had a knack for that. Um, so I had great owners, great horses, uh, you know, pretty good competitive brain and uh yeah and then also always having a a team around you that that is you know making it happen for you obviously you're nothing without your team your vet your blacksmith your head groom your your you know uh, all all your caregivers who take care of these horses without without your team you're nothing so it's a case of putting all the pieces together and then and uh you know, hopefully then it all, it all ends up at the top. Great. All of this has been really, really interesting. I really appreciate your time uh, sure thing. chatting with me. I guess, is there anything I haven't thought to ask? No, I think, I think you're spot on. <laughs> <laughs> great. Great. Well, like I said, well, thank you. I, it's been okay. great, great catching up. It was great to see you. I, I've always long admired, long admired well, thank, you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, great. And you take care. Okay. Thank you. You too. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Bye bye.
Thanks for listening to this week's episode with Leslie Burr Howard. And a big thank you to the episode sponsor, Bimeda. Learn more at bimedaus.com. You can subscribe to the Practical Horseman podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. While there, please rate and review the show. I'm Sandra Olinick, and you've been listening to the Practical Horseman podcast.